rock and roll has replaced faith, or rather is faith. Welcome to the Paul Ryder Tapes. As we all know, Paul, who was a founding member and bass player of Manchester Legends Happy Mondays, tragically passed away in July of 2022. But in the months leading up to his death, he sat down with me, his ex-wife, Angela Smith, to tell his complete life story for the very first time. We have no idea that he was about to die. And we finished recording his story just 12 days before he passed away. This is part nine of his story. Coming up in this episode. Nathan said they were thinking of getting Debbie Harry, so I said, I'm joining back again. I'm not going to imagine Debbie Harry replacing me. She used to have to look out the car window and look at the police, make sure the police aren't coming. That's terrible. I said, oh, she lived a bit. Oh, I don't know what they're doing. I think they're having an orgy or something. But I can't go, go. Well, cocaine has become the the champagne of, of the creative classes, and it's strange. It's the one thing that stops you doing good work. Been promoted from heroin to crack. Brilliant. And you know what the funny thing is? I've actually been back to Barbados on holiday, and I can't believe what a great place it is. <laughs> so your marriage is broken up, Pills and Thrills has been released. Mm -hmm. um, You've moved back in with your mum and dad. Mm -hmm. You finally got custody of your children. Yeah. How did that work, living with your mum and dad? Did they take over the majority of the childcare because you were just focusing on your band and heroin at the time? How did? How yeah, was I was still busy with the band, and they they took over parenting. Sometimes I don't know how we got through it because we always had to think of the children. So you just had to, if I thought, I'd probably have ended up breaking down myself, but you've got to think of the children. And I still had to work. I still had to carry on with yeah. with children in my work. So it was very, very hard. And you keep on a brave face. How did that feel for you? Did you notice that you weren't really there as a dad at that point? Well, I took him to school, and if I was around, I picked him up from school. Right. And but I'd, emotionally... take, I'd take uh, Jacob to football. Right. But emotionally, emotion, emotions, yeah. I, I wasn't there. Obviously, I was just numb and dead. And how does that make you feel now when you look back on that? You know, I've, got, I've still got guilt about it. But I've had seven years' worth of therapy, and I've worked through a lot of this stuff. Right. Have you made amends to your kids? For I, I make a living amends to them. What does that mean? I stay sober right. one day at a time. Right. But in terms of your relationships with your children now? With very your two, good. Especially your two older children. Yeah, now, we have like? very good relationships with both of them. Yeah. Very, very good. Do you think they've forgiven you? I think so, yeah. What do you think the worst thing was that you did? Um, okay, if I'm brutally honest, smoking heroin in the car with Amelia there, mm -hmm. with the windows up so the, the wind wouldn't blow the heroin smoke away. Wow. I know she has memories of you taking her. Uh, I, uh, she used to have to look out the car window and look at the police, make sure the police aren't coming. That's terrible. How old was she then? Four. That's really, <laughs> that's really a really extreme. In, I mean, like, how do you process that? It's seven years worth of therapy. Yeah. It took a long time. Yeah. It took a long, I know long she's time. She's had a lot of help around it too. Mm -hmm. She's really good now. Yeah, she's now a therapist. Yeah. Mhm. Mm but the the implications to everyone around you of being a heroin addict. Mm. Are so intense and immense. 
it's it's just it re it doesn't just destroy your life it destroys the life oh of it's insidious you. it's a sneaky horrible disease i'm going to jump in and tell this story because it's kind of relevant to what you just said but um sunny was a baby we just had sunny mm -hmm. and i was working i was going to work every day because i had my production company mm -hmm. and you were at home with the baby and um you were largely you were trying to stay clean there were the odd slip here and there mm -hmm. um but i i felt like it was safe enough to leave the baby with you because you seemed to be on the straight and narrow and then uh you did a gig mm -hmm. <laughs> It was at a club in Manchester. Yeah, I and you were on you were on stage. Yeah. And your drug dealers who I'd met when I'd taken you out of the drug house a mm -hmm. couple of times, mm -hmm. I caught eyes with she was in the crowd and she caught eyes with me and she came bounding over to me and she said, How are you, love? She yeah. said, Oh, your baby's lovely. Uh, uh. <laughs> and I Oh my god, I just lost it. Mm. Obviously that told me that you'd taken Sonny in the back of the car as a four month old baby mm. to go and get heroin. And from that moment onwards we got Betty in, didn't we? Yeah. Child, because I couldn't trust you with the kids anymore. Insidious disease. Lie, cheat, was, steal. You do anything so to get your drugs. Yeah. You and I anything. felt really guilty as a mother because I'd put my kid in danger by trusting you. Mm. But that's why we ended up with your mum ended up working for us. So you'd be at home, and then we'd have a childminder come to come in and mind the children while I worked. And I was the third child. Yeah, the giant baby. The giant baby. Yeah. Okay, let's stop. Uh, <laughs> it's it's half twelve. Come on, it's let's do it. Too no, fucking hot. Have a little break, and then we'll do it's another ten hot. minutes. You sure? Have you yeah. got a, what questions are you going to ask? We need to move on. <laughs> Keep recording, Stephen. Um, do you find it hard talking about this stuff? No. no. I think it's really brave of you. I think it's really brave and really um, big of you to share it and not to be glamorising. It ain't glamorous. No. It's just not glamorous. No. It just shows what... what horrible disease addiction is yeah you need to talk later about how you stop like i know it's hard but it is possible 13 rehabs and eight goals of ibogaine well the eight goals of ibogaine yeah i used to do it on my own didn't i in france yeah. and in you need Worcester. to talk about going to prague as well oh god yeah Tony Michaelides was a record promoter who worked for Factory back in the day and promoted a lot of the early Mondays records. He also had a Piccadilly radio show under the name Tony the Greek. It was the right time for a band like that because the thing is that I, in my, when I was doing my radio show right through the whole Manchester period, I was getting phone calls from A&R people in London. Basically, you know... They wanted me to do the jobs. Oh, who's coming out of Manchester? In a city like Manchester that was known for, you know, creative talent, you know, I mean, because a lot happened in Manchester apart from, I mean, the first computer was made there, you know, and all sorts of things came out of the city. And the thing is, especially with music, there's always those bands have to be there at the right time. I mean, even a band like Northside, who weren't as good at the Mondays, right, were were able to sell 60,000 albums because they supported Happy Mondays and they were on Factory Records. And the other thing is, the journalists loved Factory, so they would always write great reviews about it. It was a vibe. It was a culture. Factory was just the same. You're riding high professionally, mm -hmm. but you're riding pretty low personally. Yeah. But you don't think you are. No. Not when you're in it, you don't think you're... No. So then the next step for the Mondays was to do a new, a fourth album. Fourth album, yeah. So talk to me about that. Okay, the fourth album, the one that people say brought down Factory, and I'm here to say we didn't. <laughs> Happy Mondays did not bring down Factory Records. What did bring down Factory Records? 
um, a series of events which started by New Order hadn't done anything new for quite a number of years. Old Order. Old Order. So it was left to us to do an album. Um, Bernard Sumner was off doing his electronic project with Johnny Marr. Hooky says, if he's doing a solo album, I'm doing a solo album. So facts you pay for his Revenge album. Because I was managing Revenge around the, the time when, um, I don't know if it was Pills, Thrills and Bellier came out, or it was towards the, the end of Factory. And Factory, you know, had spent a lot of money on Revenge because Tony was honest. He felt like he owed Hooky, you know, so they were spending more on Revenge than they should have done. But, right. you know, it, it was a, one member of a band that done solo. I mean, they don't usually get big priority status and yeah. investment for marketing. What? really annoyed me the way they always blamed them for factory oh. going under oh, and no, that no, was no, not was the lie. case at that all. Was complete lies all that together. was complete lies that I was mean, not factory the case. I mean factory relied on them. Mm. I mean them in new order obviously. Yeah. Uh, another series of events I mean can we just say we're not dissing Hooky though, because Hooky was never diss Hooky, okay. oh, okay. never dissing, but he was he was furious that Bernard was doing a solo album, yeah. so he wanted to do you one. You can understand that, can't yeah, you? Yeah, of course, could. I, I, I like that revenge. <coughs> good stuff that he did, yeah. Yeah, some good stuff on it. Um, so it was it was an, a series of events that brought down Factory. Certainly not the Mondays going to Barbados. Linda and Sandra always laugh when they recall the antics when they travelled to London for a gig with Mark's dad and lovely late mum Marlene. We'd not been on the train long when out came the sandwiches oh, and the, the drinks. Oh, I know. And you sent to Marlene. Oh, Marlene, how thoughtful of you. I said, you know, I can ask you. Oh, no, she said, uh, <laughs> next door have gone away and I went to check the house and they forgot the drinks <laughs> and they forgot the sandwiches. <laughs> so I brought them for us. The reason Factory went under, right, and there's quite a lot of stuff about it, right, but the dynamic of Factory initially was that bands signed to Factory and they were, it was done on indie deals, 50-50 splits. Impressed, I thought, she yeah. And New Order, who were the ones who brought all the money in, right, and the Joy Division, they did it 50 50 split, but they never did any advertising. Because that's what New Order were about no advertising. So it was great for Factory. 50 50 split, they were making money. So then we got to London. London. We got to London. Well, we got we in got the hotel. hotel. Oh, God. And all of a sudden, oh. you came in to me. Oh, I and said, I don't know what's going on oh, next door to me with oh, Enzo. <laughs> <laughs> the first bands that Tony starts signing up, bands like the Railway Children, Northside, the Mondays, etc., etc., they started doing record deals, and the record deals. Because of Tony being so philanthropic, right, they were so weighted towards the bands rather than the company. Oh, we could hear, we're screaming. Oh, oh my... but Alan, Alan, don't do that. <laughs> she was on said, oh, don't know what's going on with the next door. <laughs> and then what happened was because lots of advertising was going on the Mondays, New Order wanted loads of advertising as well. Right? So what had been a way of making profits became a lost leader. Um, and I think partly that was the, the problem. Well, we wonder. So the next, Alan comes and not, I'd gone into you back then. Yeah. Alan came in and knocked on the door and said, Tim, you see, you can help me next door, I can't get it up. And you went, you what, what are you talking Because we were hysterical, weren't we? We were hysterical, we were terrible. I signed a band called The Adventure Babies. Everybody in the business was after them. Um, Virgin had given them 180 grand publishing, etc., etc. Everybody wanted to sign them. And I said to Tony, if I can get them for 115 grand, can we have them? 
Tony said, yeah, great. It was the bloody bed, wasn't it? Tony stuck out there. Oh, 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 not thinking I could get them. And I got them for 115 grand. And then Tony took me for a meal, Chinese, and said, we've got no money. It was one of them that One of these up, beds that it? went up and down. Yeah, and they tried to get it but down and they... Oh. It just kept going and up. that's what the <laughs> noise was, wasn't it? I was thinking, what's that going on? Now this band needed... They were like Beautiful South. They needed promotion. We didn't have the money to do any of it. Marlene was lay on the bed. <laughs> I couldn't. I said to Linda, oh, I don't know what they're doing. I think they're having an orgy or something. But I can't go. go. And I mean, poor oh, hysterical <laughs> because the bed was going, woo, woo, woo. <laughs> Tony thought I was the one who would be end up being the general manager of Factory. Thank God it wasn't me because I had no idea what I was doing. But, you know, I would have looked at the finances maybe better. There's something weird stuff went on at the end. Yeah. But it's not the Monday's fault. <laughs> and he had to come and get Ken yeah. to stop the bed. <laughs> stop the bed. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, that's all oh, look at that. Oh, beautiful. Oh, this is Baxter. And what kind is he? He's a dandy Dimmont Terrier, which is a vulnerable breed. Uh, from the borders of Scotland, he has very little legs, a very big head, a long body. He actually has a face. <laughs> it looks like he's got a face. Is that right, Baxter? Uh, and he's just been neutered. Was it not the Hacienda going south? Yeah, but that was going on for years as well. That was, yeah. you know, that was New Order's money being put straight back into the hacienda yeah you know and i can see why they was pissed off about it yeah um all their money because the hacienda never made any money for many many no. years not until they never that, sold alcohol it just, uh, just yeah. had people getting water because they were all on ease people getting water and everyone had stopped buying alcohol um but it was, don't forget it was open for 10 years before that that rave scene happened yeah. And they put some great bands on. Yeah. I saw some mega bands at the Hacienda. And all that was due to Mike Pickering. Yeah. He was the, he was the one booking the bands and he seemed to get bands just as it was about to break. Yeah. So you'd see them and it'd be like 30 or 40 people in the audience. Yeah. Can you remember yeah. who you saw that? Oh, God, I saw Simple Minds, Culture Club, Orange Juice. Um, um, oh, God. I saw electronic there. Uh, electro I saw electronic there. Oh, maybe we'll be there yeah. at the same time. Um, uh, Gil Scott Heron. Nico. Saw oh, Nico. Wow. That was a weird one. Everyone was just sat on the floor. Really? Yeah, all gouching out. <laughs> I saw loads of bands there. So, Barbados. Who decided that Barbados was a good idea and why? Um... Barbados was a good idea because there was no heroin on the island. Okay. Uh, was Tony aware that you were on heroin as well at this point? I thought nobody knew. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was completely incognito on it and nobody nobody knew, but apparently everybody knew. Well, I've always thought of heroin as being a mistress because you don't want to tell anyone about her. So she's always in the dark, you know, it's always hush, hush. Hush, hush, you know, you don't say, oh, hey, look, I'm going, you know, it's, uh, and she's a very seductive mistress. <laughs> she'll be really nice to you, but by the end, oh, uh, she'll ruin you. <laughs> I just didn't advertise it like Sean did. So when you realised you had a problem, how did you feel about that? Well, everybody had problems in our bands, band, really. So it's just normal. I'd be, be more surprised if they didn't have problems. But um, with the drug problem, I still didn't realise what his main drug was because I would have thought the one we saw him taking the most would have been cocaine. Um, yeah. And then it's only because, as I said, I've been out to score with him in King's Cross and I know it's heroin was a problem as well. I really didn't know how bad his problem was. Did it affect the way you play? Did it affect your motivation with the band? Did it have a negative effect on your career in that sense? 
Just negative effect on a friendship with Gaz. Right. Really negative. Yeah. You know. But even in Bar I wasn't on it in Barbados because there was none there and I wasn't on methadone. So how did you come off it then? Slowly. Before you went to Barbados? Yeah. You knew that you were going to have to get off it? Yeah. How was that then? Was that easy to do? Um, it got easier once we got in the sun, in the sunshine of Barbados and I was going in to sea every day, hmm. walking down the beach. Yeah. You know, I had like a whole beach to myself. Yeah. We got to Barbados and he was really ill with stomach pains and cramps and they took it, you know, he used to get out of anxiety, didn't he? They couldn't find anything, it was anxiety, but I think it was probably a little bit of missing that as well. I think maybe he just started getting, you know. The first week we recorded drums, so I was stuck in the studio for the week with, with the percussionist and the producers to get the drum. And then we got the bass in and I remember said to get the, Paul get the bass in on day six to come in and then uh, she said, oh, he's got in do, he's doing the crap, but he still came in and did it. I remember him not being right and trying to hide it from me. I am saying, Paul. Um, so the idea was to go there with a big supply of methadone for Sean, which um, Trish, his then girlfriend, dropped on the floor in the airport in Manchester and it went everywhere. And we were scooping it up. We ran downstairs to a little kiosk shop. We got bottles of water, took the water outside, scooping it up into bottles off the floor, bits of glass in it. Oh. We had to strain it with a pair of stockings once we got to once we got to Barbados to get all the glass out of it. So you know, he had huge five hundred mil bottles and they smashed. So he he hardly had anything, any supply. Right. And um he just went into he went into that self destruct mode. He got some tablets off the then doc off the doctor, so he shuffled for six weeks and didn't get any lyrics done. Um, but as as far as it, it being chaos, it wasn't. We worked really hard. The band worked every day from ten in the morning till ten at night, and that was writing produced. an album. It was great. Um, you know, it was studio with the pool. You could make it up. Nice food. Uh, you didn't know it was your last album, but it felt like it's your last song, the way things happened out there. Well, Barbados was uh, quite quite an uh, insane thing. So we went out there because there was supposed to be no drugs there, and obviously uh, uh, there was a crack of a, a, a fucking pandemic going on. And it, I can tell you a really funny story, though. One night, me, me and Paul had been smoking fucking the thing in, and uh, we decided we was going to go to the six rows to get some more. And on the way, we seen uh, Sean's car on the road, upside down in the middle of the road. I said to Paul, like, pull the car over now. So we pulled over. I said, we'll get the battery, you know, because we could swap it for a crap. So we both got out the thing and popped the... Uh, and he'd already took the battery with him, and then. But uh, the great thing about that album was we got to work with Chris France and Seema Weymouth. And uh, even though that album got slated, I actually thought it was a really good album. It was one of the best albums, you know what I mean? And, and because it didn't have that modern production, what everyone wanted. But when you listen back, uh, you know, it's a great fucking album. And to get to work with Talking Heads, you know what I mean, with, with some of your heroes as well, and being a... And you know what the funny thing is? I've actually been back to Barbados on holiday. And I can't believe what a great place it is. <laughs> it was produced by Tina Weymouth and... and Chris France from Pro Talking Heads, the rhythm section from Talking Heads, yeah. which was incredible for me. Yeah. That was just like a dream come true. Yeah. I think they did a great job. It's one of it's my favourite album. Yeah. And Gaz Whelan's favourite album. Yeah, I like that. You album. know, Sean's not going to like it because Sean was in a bad space at the time. Right. He's never going to like it. Yeah. What about the crack, though? Didn't Sean do loads of crack because there was no heroin? Or yeah. Was it just a myth? No, no, he did. Yeah. yeah. And I'm guilty as well. I yeah. did it. Yeah. And PD did it. Yeah. You know. And Bez. And Bez did it. Did you go to Barbados to do Yes, Please? No, I didn't. I think I'd, I think I'd, I'd, I'd just gone to and joined Perfecto, Paul Okafor's label. So I had to make it, and Tina and Chris were recording there. Um, 
So, no, I'm thinking I'm lucky I didn't go to Barbados. And then um, I think Nathan said they were thinking of getting Debbie Harry. So I said, I'm joining back again. I'm not wondering. Imagine Debbie Harry replacing me because Tina, Tina Francis, friends with her. I didn't care who replaced me if they needed a girl, but not Debbie Harry. I fucking love Debbie Harry. So I was like, no. So then all, all of a sudden, my label, my record deal can fuck off. I'm going to Barbados. Just call me when you need me. Mm. I had a bad accident, didn't he? Yeah, he's a... He broke his arm, he flipped over the jeep, which was like, um, there was no roof on it, it was, mm-hmm. but there was roll bars, yeah. Mm-hmm. But he broke his arm, and while he was on the uh, operating, in the operating theater, he got a disease in his bones, mm-hmm. and it turned to mush. And if he hadn't got back to England when he did, he could have lost his arm. Wow. It was, uh, it was really bad. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But as far as it being complete chaos and nobody doing anything it was it was heavy work everything while i was in barbados that three week i've got lovely photographs with sean everything seemed to be fine and dandy when i was around and i think after i came home we were hearing these stories and i'm thinking oh my god what on earth is going to happen next it was just chaos, and I thought, oh, fuck, this is it. I better find a job. <laughs> <laughs> Drugs come as part of the package in rock and roll, in fame, in celebrity. And some drugs you can survive. Um, some drugs you can't. I mean, I'm not someone to knock cocaine, but in the music industry, it is the great destroyer of talent. It was, to be honest, to go to Barbados, which was like, you know, the capital of the Caribbean, but we didn't know that. But, you know, you say you've been promoted from heroin to crack. Brilliant. Everyone knows why, if you take cocaine, apart from feeling good for a while, everyone knows why it makes you think that when you're doing crap, it's genius. Because that's what the drug does but no one has ever established why it automatically makes you do crap. Well, I knew we had the songs. The songs were were okay. It was just um, um, the atmosphere that you never knew what was happening next. And it's it's just the reality of the creative industry. And more and more, cocaine has become the the champagne of, of the creative classes. And it's strange. It's the one thing that stops you doing good work. Bez would be off gallivanting, killing himself. Sean would be doing the same. Hospital bills, people not getting paid, producers going on strike, or engineers. And this was because we were running out of money. It was bleeding, the factory was bleeding. And we were trying to, nobody else had put putting a record out. And um, it's something that, I mean, some of the worst drugs, like heroin, do not stop you creating this. Really? How was Paul during that time? <clears throat> he was, yeah, he had issues as well. The great line from Armut Ertigan, or Nessu Ertigan, one of the great Atlantic guys, which says, you know, don't worry about heroin. Some of my biggest artists are junkies. They've been junkies for 30 years. They've been giving me platinum albums for 30 years. Um. He was still playing, but it was a case of Chris and Tina change. It was it was just getting a bit like weird. That's you know one of the world's great horror drugs, supposedly heroin. Doesn't stop you creating great work, as anyone who has studied the history of British poetry knows. Because um, we was there for a month and a bit, and uh, we, we you know we didn't get the vocals down. But when it comes to cocaine, it stops you producing. And I mean, I've had. Anyone who's worked in the record industry for any while has had their share of cocaine albums. Um, and I just couldn't see it. This isn't going to, you know... But uh, I won't even say which mine one was, but um, it was almost as bad as Tin Machine. And it's not one of those things where they build you up and they chop you down, but we chopped ourselves down, you know. <laughs> and in case you're wondering, Tony did name a cocaine album and it wasn't Yes Please, just in case you're wondering. So Paul, one of Paul's big bugbears was that the Mondays got blamed for Factory going under. Yeah, not true. I mean, we we kind of got pushed to go and do that album, even though we'd only half written it because 
I don't think New Order had done an album for a while, so they relied on New Order and us for a little bit of funding because they'd signed all these bands. So we were pushed into it. When we actually split up, Factory owed us money. When the Factory went bankrupt, they owed us, they owed us money. Is it just a myth that Sean sold the furniture in the studio for crack? Absolute nonsense. Really? Yeah. Complete wow. bullshit. Where did that myth come from? It came from... He was... We used to get... We used to get a crack off a guy who lived in a hut in the middle of a field and he didn't have any chairs. Yeah. He just had some sponge on the floor. So there was one chair, I think it was next to the rubbish bins outside the studio, and Sean put it in the car. He was taking the big man a chair. Right. And then it just went on from there. <laughs> next thing it turned out to be the whole studio went missing and we sold it all for crack. It was complete bullshit. Really? Absolute bullshit. How did you get on with Chris and Tina? Great. Really good. Yeah. Really, Were they really... pleased with the album? Um, I've never asked them. Yeah. I've never it must asked have been them. frustrating for them that Sean didn't do any... Do you do no lyrics whatsoever? Like nothing? He tried to, and Tina took time out with him in a room on, on their own and tried to get him motivated. But he was just in a, he was just in a mess. He couldn't mm. do anything. Mm. So we aborted the, uh, the mission. And then Sean obviously wasn't doing any vocals. Um, I was getting sent what he, to what he'd... Somebody's came back and, and played me. I don't know if it was on a cassette or what it was. What he'd done. And it was just... Um, it was just horrible. It was vile, vile shouting. But I wish the lyrics would have been kept on. The original suffering and the problems we were having. Because it was redone, the lyrics. And I think uh, it took the... Uh, the true feeling. This wasn't nice and it wasn't tuneful, it wasn't any good. Um, and apparently that's the only vocals, they hadn't got much vocals at all, just ranting, but not funny, not not um, po poetic in any way. So yeah, so they said you probably will be needed, but Sean, he, they were telling me what happened with the heroin and stuff and he wasn't able to write on crack. So you wrote all the music for wrote all of the all tracks? all the music for all the tracks, took it back to England. Yeah, so we, we did all our bits in um, Lingfield in Surrey which was brilliant. And um, Horse came there and he came, nobody, nobody from the band really came, they weren't allowed because Sean had to get his head down and get the vocals done. Sean went in rehab, came out and did his lyrics. And I think it's some of his finest work. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Where did the pain start? Where yeah. did the symptoms begin? <laughs> yeah. He's done some great and stinking thinking, best anti-drug song in the world. Yeah. 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 I think it's his finest work. Compliment for yeah. your brother. Yeah. Okay, we've got to stop. Okay. Okay, so we're back again. How do you feel about how this is going so far? It's like a very heavy therapy session. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, exhausting. Yeah. It really is exhausting. I went. I went to the hotel last night and just slept. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you think that is? I just. Probably because I'm talking about myself. Yeah. And it's not really a, a done thing for me. Right. I'm usually very private. Does so. it? Is it bringing up bad memories or good memories or...? Just memories. Memories, good and bad. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, you know. Do you feel like you're digging deeper than you're comfortable doing? At some points, yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah, but because I know you so well... It's kind of okay. Yeah. You know, if anyone else was asking me the questions, I'd probably just clam up. <laughs> <laughs> I can't let you get away with that, though, can no. I? No. <laughs> All right, so we, we left off the last uh, session talking about Barbados. Yeah. And the recording of Yes, Please. Mm-hmm. Which um, was very, very enjoyable, I'll say it again. It was probably one of the best times of my career, working with Chris France and Tina Weymouth. Why was that? Because I'm such a big fan of talking ads. Yeah. Big fan of talking ads. I remember it was 1970, 77, 78. Ad came on from work and he said, I've got tickets for, to see the Ramones tonight. And I thought, yeah, great, I'll go and see the Ramones. But we got there early and there was a band on before them. And it's like, well, this, these aren't punk. I don't know what they are. And it turned out to be talking ads. 
they were supporting the Ramones on a British tour. Oh. So I saw I saw the Talking Heads early days. Yeah. And at that very same concert, I found out years and years later through Dennis and Lois, there was a young kid who was with his dad at the same Ramones concert. And Dennis and Lois got him backstage to meet the Ramones. And it turned out to be the guy from the Doves. Oh, wow. When he was like nine years old. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Incredible. Wow. So when you were working with them, were you starstruck? Were you nervous? I was nervous a bit, yeah. It was like, wow, fucking, I can't believe I'm doing this. Yeah, but that, it soon it soon got down to serious business of writing tunes and jamming and playing in the studio. What are they like as people? Lovely, lovely people. In what sense? Just nice, kind, encouraging, very encouraging. Yeah, were they fans of the Mondays? I think so. Yeah, I think they'd definitely heard of us or they'd done their homework. They'd definitely done the homework on us. How did it come about that they were the ones producing the album? Um, I heard a song called Tomorrow People by Ziggy, I think it was Ziggy Marley, and they produced it. And it was a great pop song, really well produced. When we were trying to think of producers for the next album, when Oakenfold and Osborne wasn't available, but it transpires, it wasn't really that they weren't available. Of course I wanted to do it. I mean, you know, who wouldn't want it coming off of a platinum record, you know, a record that changed culture uh, in terms of bringing dance and indie music together and creating a sound called indie dance that Enemy and Melody Maker always used to quote, say to me, oh, you you know, this sound, this indie dance. And so, of course, we wanted to do it, but there was no demos. It was a recipe. I, you know, I, I know enough about music to know when to do something and when not to. And then drugs were really, really in the mix big time. There's a lot heavier drugs going on. You want us to record an album with nothing just to go there, and you know everyone's going to go like that. They weren't getting on, so everyone's going to go their own ways. And then suddenly it's down to Steve and I to go, da, da, da. it didn't feel right for me. And I, and I was the one who put my hand out, and I, just, I was like, I ain't doing it. I, 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 it doesn't, we're going to be in trouble here, Steve. It ain't going to work. And that's when, and as I say, I love them. They're great. I'm a fan. <clears throat> and, but it didn't feel right. And I'm glad, glad we didn't do it. And Nathan McGough was like, you made the biggest fucking mistake of your career. Da, 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 da. They're going to be as big as Pink Floyd. And I'm like, Nathan, I want to do this, but you've got to do demos. We've got to figure out what we're going to do. Because if we don't, it's going to turn into a mess. Um, it was me that said Chris Vance and um, Tina Weymouth because they'd done this song and it was really good. So me and Nathan went over to see him in New York. Did you? Yeah, we went, went to their house in Connecticut and yeah. stayed the night, stayed the night in a hotel, but went to their house. Yeah. And um, they had a great big studio at the back of the house called the Tom Tom Club. Right. That was the name of their studio. Huh. And we went in there and saw all this old equipment and it was like, it was great. Love talking heads, love yeah. talking, yeah. So I can now say I've worked with two in the rhythm section of Talking Ads. Yeah. Which is a great on my CV. Do you ever use your CV for anything? No. <laughs> <So you laughs> it's don't need just to. there if I need it. Yeah. We talked about you not being a classically trained musician before, didn't we? Yeah. Did that get in the way in the studio with them? No, not at all. Not at all. Because oh. I don't think they're... Um, I don't think they're trained musicians. I think they're self-taught as well. Yeah. Were they frustrated with how Sean was in Barbados? I think so, yeah. Yeah. What makes you think that? Well, they never got the job done, did they? They had to kind of hold their hands up and say, we're going to have to fi finish the session. You can't, you can't do it. Did they then post-produce when he'd done the lyrics, when he'd done the vocals in New York? Did they then No, he involved? did the vocals in London. 
Oh, so who then put the, put the thing together? Chris and Tina came oh, over. Oh, right. So they yeah. came back. So they did finish the album. They finished then. the job eventually, yeah. Right. Yeah, after you come out of rehab. Yeah. Was it hard to convince them to do the album? I don't think so, no. Oh. No. Because they'd met me and Nathan. Right. You know. Why was it that you went with Nathan and not one of the others? Um, It was my job. Was it? Yeah. They called you Monday Head, didn't Monday they? Monday Head, yeah. Like... Paul McCartney and the Beatles was Beetlehead. Oh, really? Everything was just Beatles, <laughs> Beatles, 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 Beatles. That's all that mattered. And and that was the same with me and the Mondays. Yeah. That's like... The band was the only thing that mattered. And he was like... So he was like, we'd, we'd be doing something. Oh, let's just go out drinking. We'll go out to the pub. He'd be like, we've got we're doing, we've got a thingy tomorrow. Well, I'll be all right. And he was quite sensible. Is that a good thing? Yeah. Yeah. Did, did other aspects of your life suffer as a result of that? I don't think so, no. It was just that I was really into the job. It was a great job. What advice would you give to young groups now that are just setting off? Like, What's, what's the secret to really getting the success and traction that you need? I don't success. know about success, but the, the only thing I can say is just write, keep on writing. Write as many songs as you can. Just keep writing and writing and writing and writing and you'll get better. Right. What about preserving relationships within the group? Because I don't know how you feel about how how and if your relationship with Sean has negatively affected the trajectory of the Mondays. I would mm. argue it probably has. Oh, yeah. 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 How would you advise people to avoid that happening in groups? Probably talk to each other. Like gentlemen. Right, but well, if you've got a beef with somebody, how how do you get over that? How do you? Probably by talking. Just by talking. We never spoke to. We never spoke about anything like that. It was just like, he's opinionated, Sean. Yeah. His opinion counts to him and him only, and it's the only opinion. You know, right. you can't have a conversation with him. Did the rest of the group feel the same way as you? Yeah, you, you can't have a conversation with my brother. It's impossible. Hmm. And, and everybody else felt the same. Is that part of the magic, though, too? If, if he had been a more reasonable person, do you think that maybe the Mondays wouldn't have had the secret sauce that they had? I think that's probably true, yeah. What? Yeah. That it was part of the magic. Yeah. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Ruined our relationship, but made the band better. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so you came back from Barbados. Yeah. And then the album got released. It wasn't greatly well received by the critics, was it? No, but it, it was a hit record. It got to number 14 in the charts. Yeah. And um, it was one of the last things to be released on factory records before they went under what was the last video that you did last official one was sunshine love but the band weren't really involved with it so the last one was probably um judge fudge i reckon okay. or loose fit maybe and how many years had gone by between the first one and that last one that you did three three would you say they changed as people during that time were they different to work with when they got some success under their belt? Not in the slightest. I, I would say if they had, because with us, the relationship was exactly the same from day one until the end. It was no different at all. They were yeah. exactly the same. And it, that's probably because we didn't hang out together and we weren't, didn't have like all those different weird personal dynamics. We were just, we worked together we saw each other when we were out and, you know, we got on and trusted each other sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? In a professional capacity. Because they were, yeah. you know, people go on like how unprofessional they were, but they weren't really with us because we were, you know, we weren't, we, I, I certainly wasn't taking drugs while I was making those videos because I thought, well, what's, you know, why, why would I do that when we've got to get a video made? Everybody else is off their fucking box. 
you know, it would be a disaster if I was taking drugs and partying while making the videos, which I know happened with other people, not to mention names, but we talked about them before. Um, but it wasn't that, that wasn't what it was like. So, you know, if the band were taking drugs, that's fine. If it helps the performance, it doesn't bother me. You know what I mean? So, yeah. I don't know how we got into drugs. But, but no, it was just a professional relationship is what I'm saying. And they were quite professional. Once you get them to turn up, as long as, you know, and they always just turned up. That was like, always like, are they going to turn up? You know, we did spend one day when, after we'd made um, 24 hour party pit, we thought, oh, we've got to do like pickups for this because we've just, you know, the camera went down, we've just got some Super 8, we've got to fill in the gaps somehow. Um, so we arranged to film, to get them together on another day, and we literally drove around for about six hours around North Manchester trying to get the band together, and then it went dark and we never did it. You know, we never even got anywhere. We filmed a little bit with Sean in the rehearsal studios, I think, but never got the band together again. So, yeah, yeah it was just difficult communication. But... It was a good time all the time for me making those videos. It was everything I could have dreamed of, you know, because, like, I've made other videos and they're never as much fun, really. Favourite tracks off that album? Oh, I mentioned it earlier, uh, Stinking Thinking. Yeah. Great. Sunshine and Love's my favourite. Yeah, you I like that one, don't you? And it's one Angel. of Gaz's favourites as well. Yeah, I remember that, yeah. Yeah. And um, Angel's good as well. Angel's really good, yeah. yeah. Angel's really good. I think that that album has those real standout tracks, mm. whereas Pills and Thrills is like every song is brilliant. Yeah. I think mm. that individually the three songs that st or, or more that stand out on, mm -hmm. on Yes Please are actually better than the ones on Pills and Thrills. But oh, that's good. I think there's... Like, there's one track that doesn't have any vocals on it at all, isn't there? Yeah, you couldn't... It's mainly PD's... Uh, <laughs> mainly PD's uh, little masterpiece that he did. And yeah. I could just couldn't get any vocals for it, so it just ended up being an, our one and only instrumental. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my fa one of my favourite tracks is Total Ringo. Um, and I think our kid sings like John Lennon on that one. Yeah. Really stretching his vocal cords. I think he sounds like Lennon after the Beatles. Yeah. Yeah. So the album, you toured, you did a tour with that album, didn't you? Yeah, which was, the tour was great. I saw some footage not so long ago and we was tight, man. We was a really tight band. It was like all the songs were so tight and polished. Yeah. It was all getting on really well. And your addiction was still underpinning everything at this point, I'm guessing. Yeah, I still, I was still thinking nobody knew, but everybody knew. Yeah. At that point. And I got the phone call from Mark Day just as I was leaving my house. I just opened it to lock up, um, and I thought he was joking. Not horses, awesome, because he put me Mark, Mark Day saying, "Ro, got some really bad news." Or so he said, I think he's just said like that, and it just didn't seem obviously you don't think because we're about to get on the bus. Um, and then it, it really became quickly, it was obvious it wasn't, it wasn't a joke. Um, that's it. Went to Linda's, um, just sat for ages and spoke to Bez. Yeah, we just in shock. Well, I had to go, I just wanted to um, be with because they said he's still there. Sean was saying we should still do the gig at some point as well. And I was like, I can't, I can't even get on the bus. I sit opposite him or next to him. I, he's either there in front of me with his back to me or facing me on all the journeys on our bus. I can't, there's either a table between us or a chair back. I can't travel anywhere today without him being there. It's just impossible. But knowing he's still there, and I was actually hoping his body wouldn't still be there, to be honest, because I just didn't want to see um a body but um Amelia told me to go in and say goodbye to her dad and it really didn't want to see but it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be I spoke to him I was honestly I was in and out as quick as I could be I just said you know I love you and everything he did look like he was still alive and I'm glad I did now um because it makes it real then as well because you have to know it's real and you just have to accept it's happened you've got to and he's not coming back otherwise you go you go mad really it was lovely going there that day, though, and being with everyone, being with his mum anyway. But Amelia, she was just saying, will I ever be happy again? It was awful. And he was very present in her life, so it's just, um, it's horrible. It yeah. still is. 
coming up in the next episode. I remember lying there one night thinking, what the hell's just happened? You know, we all knew it was over, but with each other we was in denial it was over. The guy from London Records had gone and said, if you can't turn up for £3 million, <laughs> I don't want to sign them. It was a lifeline. Absolutely fucking gutted. That's it for this week. Please join our club and become a patron of the show to help us keep these episodes going. Go to our website, which is paulrider.tv, for the details. And there also you'll find our shop with some cool Paul Ryder and Big Arm merch. Big Arm is the band that you can hear right now. It was Paul's favourite side project from the Mondays, and this is their track, Welcome, which was finished the night Chico, his youngest son, was born, hence the name. Please join in the conversation in the comments, and remember we'll be back next week, same time, same place, for the premiere of the video version of next week's show at 8pm UK time. And don't forget that the next episode drops right now in podcast form on all the usual podcast platforms, so if you can't wait, you can listen to it right now. Finally, please subscribe to the YouTube channel if you've not already done so. We will be back next week with more. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to all our guests. And as usual, the biggest thanks has to go to the one and the only, the late, great Paul Anthony Ryder. I certainly can't ever say I've had a dull life.